morning. Good morning. Um, I think it's time we start. So uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming. Thanks for braving the traffic both uh, far from campus and particularly right around campus. Um, it is, today is the um, Explore Day, I think it's called, Explore USC. So it's the high school students who've expressed interest in coming and their parents. So it's very exciting out there, but hard to get in the parking structures. So thank you for braving that. We're actually short a speaker, um, but we can put her at the end of the lineup here for the first panel. She'll show up in a, in, in a minute. I'm sure she's still trying to park. So I'm Bill Deverell, the uh, director of the Huntington USC Institute on California in the West. Uh, as well as the Collections Convergence Initiative here uh, with the libraries and the rest of campus. I'm thrilled to have today come to fruition. Delighted there's so many of you here. We're going to have a really lively, rollicking day underneath us. Um, it's just really great to see everybody here. It does take a village to put on something like this, and I want to um, take a minute just to thank everybody who's helped us. Uh, it's really a privilege to work with such a talented team of colleagues and friends, intellectually, logistically, bureaucratically, financially, you name it, um, a lot of skills coming together to put on something like this. So it's a privilege and pleasure to thank those folks. Um, institutionally, I want to thank uh, my friends and colleagues in the Institute of California in the West, the Huntington Library, and particularly uh, the photo folks at the Huntington Library who helped us a great deal to produce images uh, that made up the publicity of uh, advertising this conference under LA. I want to thank the college here at USC, USC Dornsife, uh, who helped fund this, particularly Dean uh, Catherine Quinlan, uh, as well as Dean Amber Miller at the um, USC College. Good morning, Emily. Uh, there's coffee if you need it. There's our paleontologist, so it's great. Um, I want to thank uh, Vice Dean Peter Mankall, uh, my friend and colleague in the history business, who's um, uh, the Dean of the Humanities program in the college who helps support this as well. I want to thank Lost LA, our partner from uh, the library and KCET, and particularly Nathan Masters. Special thanks to the Sydney Harmon uh, Academy for Polymathic Study. Um, Karen, where are you? Karen Hubner, the program director of that outfit and one of the gems of this campus and of LA and Southern California and California and the nation generally. Um, Karen has been delightful to work with. Um, my friend and colleague, fellow historian, uh, who's helped us in any number of ways to put on this conference, as well as uh, cleverly uh, reserving that room, this room, and that room all day for us. That room is an overflow room. If we pack up, and we did get a lot of RSVPs, if we pack up, hold your seat, and we'll send the newcomers into the overflow room where we're live feeding the, we're live streaming the conference, which is great. And then at lunch, we'll be in the room down here. We'll feed you lunch. We'll have a little bit of a, a loaves and fishes operation. So please, in your first pass through for lunch, be modest for us because we probably calibrated just about right but we'll be happy to feed you. Uh, so lunch will be down there. Uh, and then we'll also be screening uh, a film from Lost LA about underneath uh, subterranean tunnels in LA during the lunchtime. But special thanks to, to Karen. Uh, thanks to the Los Angeles Public Library and their photo people who helped us a great deal. Thanks to Take One, who are our audiovisual and film uh, partners here. Thank you very much, guys, uh, for being with us. And then in particular, I want to thank some people quickly. Um, Victoria Bernal, Victoria, where are you? Victoria Bernal is our social media maven uh, through the Institute on California in the West and all things social media and social media platforms. Uh, Victoria reminds me that if you want to continue the conversation about subterranean landscapes and subterranean cultures in LA, uh, we're at hashtag under LA, uh, servicing all platforms. By all means, enter that conversation and contribute. Nathan Masters, I noted. Uh, Karen Hubner, Hubner, I noted. Elizabeth Logan, who will be with us this afternoon with 35 high school students in tow. Um, she is the Associate Director of the Institute on California in the West and helped us immensely. Taryn Haydostian, uh, Taryn is in the back corner. Could you raise your hand? This conference does not take place without Karen, uh, Taryn's uh, genius in making this film that you saw, uh, as well as helping us with all manner of visual imagery. Um, <laughs> technical support, logistical support. Taryn is the administrative director of the Institute on California in the West. And lastly, David Yulin, 
uh, who will come up here in a second. Uh, this conference has been, morning Nathan, this conference has been um, so much fun to plan with my friend and colleague David Eulin. Uh, this is our fourth conference that we've done together. Um, and I can't tell you how intellectually and uh, otherwise fulfilling working with David is. Um, essentially, this conference has been in plans for over a year, uh, and it generally um, moves through, let's go have a beer and talk about things we're interested in, and then over the course of a year, here we are. So uh, my thanks to David for um, support, friendship, and intellectual uh, camaraderie. Um, it really is terrific. So the day will proceed, as you know, from the program. If you don't have the program, they're out there. Um, we'll have a series of panels and presentations moving across disciplines about under LA. We'll try, um, to the best of our ability, to leave room for conversation and questions with our panelists. But of course, we'd like to spend the whole day together, so lunchtime and then a reception in the afternoon to continue this conversation. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, lem oh, logistics. Please help us. The library has some very fancy VIP event here tonight starting at 6. Um, we will leave here no later than about between 5 and 6, I suspect. We, no, we're done with the conference at 4, but maybe people want to mill around. We'll start showing you the doors around 5, I imagine. But please help us police your site all day. There are trash cans everywhere. Um, please pitch in and help us keep things clean. Bathrooms are, uh, women's room is right out the door here. Men's room is down this hallway all the way to the end. Um, and please help us keep those places neat as well. And I did remind you about um, let's have lunch together and, again, eat modestly your first pass through, and then if there's food left, go crazy. All right? Uh, so, again, thank you so much for being here. I'm going to turn things over to David, and then I'll come back up here and introduce our first panel. Enjoy your day. This one? Yes. Okay, great. This one. Okay, hi. Can everybody hear me? All right, thank you all for coming. Thanks, Bill, for, um, for basically also for handling the logistics. I was having a conversation with my wife earlier this week about something practical. I can't remember what it was, something I had not heard of or paid attention to in the outside world, and she said, you really have no idea what's going on, do you? <clears throat> I said, no, I don't. So, um, so I'm here to present the, um, I guess, the, the philosophical underpinning or the, the, the thing that someone who has no idea of how to deal with practical matters would bring up. Um, I want to say, you know, um, all of these, I, I see these, these sort of conferences or, or symposia as uh, that Bill and I have been doing for the last several years. I think the first one was in 2013. Um, as kind of chapters in an ongoing book or an ongoing public discussion um, about Los Angeles. And in some ways, this, is, this one here is a kind of quintessential to that process because it, it, occurs, it, it has always seemed to me that Los Angeles is a city that yields its depths um, very, I don't want to say reluctantly exactly, but um, you have to work a little bit, right? Um, it's a city that is routinely derided as being superficial and existing only on the surface. Um, like all cliches about Los Angeles, that is equally true and not true, or uh, as Chinamanda Adichie says um, about stereotype, uh, true but not true enough. Um, and I think that that's one of the impetuses for all of the work that Bill and I have, have been doing over the last several years, and particularly um, this conference, the idea of taking a look at the city on its own terms, taking a look at the city as what it is. I think in terms of this con uh, conversation, I always think of the Rainer Banham line, a description of LA, um, from 1971 where he's, he called it a city that is um, 70 miles wide but barely 70 years deep. Um, you know, I have a soft spot for Bantam, um, and I think that that may have been accurate in that moment, but I also think that there's a lot of stuff going on here. Um, a lot of my own work has focused on, uh, on those kind of questions. When I first moved here and was trying to make sense of the city, I found myself drawn into um, questions of, of neighborhood versus sprawl, thinking about how the city fit together, thinking about what I would almost describe as order out of chaos. It's a disorderly city that somehow finds its own order in its disorder, which is deeply appealing to me as a kind of a concept. Um, I did a lot of work on seismology and earthquakes, partly because I wanted to stay in California, and I knew that if I didn't reassure myself about either my safety or just simply the randomness of everything, um, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be able to stay. I ended up with the latter. Um, I don't think that safety is a concept that I believe in, but I want to quote one very short 
um, sentence about Los Angeles from John Gregory Dunn. All life is inherently dangerous, but beyond that, Los Angeles is just a wonderful place to be. Um, so I think in that sense, I don't want to make too broad of a claim for Los Angeles as metaphor for everything, although I think we could make that claim, and maybe we will make that claim. Um, but I'm really interested in this idea of peeling back the surface. One of, as I said, Los Angeles is deceptive in the sense that we think of it, or we're told to think of it, as a kind of shallow, superficial landscape. It actually is the city that I've had to do the most work to live in um, of any city good work, I mean satisfying work, to understand it. And so, um, and I think it also belies or, or stands against in some ways traditional um, demarcations of, of, of discipline, of, of genre, of, of intellectual life. We can look at that in terms of its, its aesthetic culture, and we can look at that in terms of its broader intellectual culture. So one of the ideas for this, um, for this conference was to look beneath the surface, and to look beneath the surface in whatever way that represents. So you will hear from, uh, we'll, we'll be talking about the, uh, the infrastructure of the city, we'll be talking about the geologic structure of the city, the kind of um, the flora and fauna of the city, and the intellectual life of the city. I'm really interested in the notion of underground through all of these, um, through all of these lenses, and through the idea of allowing that concept to open up our sense of the city and the territory as both a physical and a social, or actually not both, as, as a physical, a social, and an intellectual um, space. So without uh, meaning, uh, so not to belabor it, I'll, I'll, I'll stop now, and I think we'll start with the first panel, but i um, delighted that all of you are here, and thanks uh, to Bill, and thanks to everyone who's involved in, in getting this set up. Thank you. Okay. So why don't I ask, um, Bob, Joe, and Emily to come on up here, if they don't mind. Uh, we've got uh, handheld mics here. Um, we're going to proceed with um, Joe first. Um, Emily, where have you gone? So we'll get Emily back in here in a second. Um, what I'd like to do, uh, we have until 11.15 um, for this first panel with our three natural scientists. Um, <clears throat> and what I'd like to do is open things up first, asking each of them in Siri, series, uh, in sequence, what it is they do beneath us, and then each of them have a bit of a, a presentation that they'd like to offer as well, uh, and then we may have some dialogue. Um, let's make sure those microphones are on, they look good. Hello, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Got it, got it, okay. Okay, so let's just start, let's just entirely casually, um, this is Joe Parker right here, you've got your program so you know who everyone is, this is Bob DeGroote, and this is Dr. Emily Lindsay. Um, so let me just start with Joe, what do you do? I am a lifelong entomologist. I've collected insects since I was about this high, and uh, I managed to like turn that into a job that pays the bills and ended up getting hired uh, as an assistant professor at Caltech, where I study the uh, evolution of uh, symbiotic interactions between uh, ants and beetles as a kind of model to understand how interspecies interactions emerge at the genetic and uh, behavioral and neurobiological level uh, in, the, in the animal kingdom. Um, so my work is part laboratory based uh, and part field based because we go out into the greater Los Angeles area and collect these things and bring them into the lab. Um, and uh, currently right now I've just started uh, and so a lot of what I'm doing day to day is actually building up the infrastructure in my lab to be able to run a research program. It's really exciting times. And, uh, Terrific. I'm super happy to be here today. To, Great, uh, and Joe's just here. joined the Caltech faculty this fall, so he's brand new to Los Angeles and uh, to the California Institute of Technology. Bob, how about you, what do you do? I'm, I'm Bob DeGroot. I am with the US Geological Survey Earthquake Science Center in Pasadena, and I manage the communication education and outreach program for the Shaker Alert Earthquake Early Warning System for the west coast of the US. And so I'm involved in engaging technical partners to take earthquake early warning to industry, but also teaching individuals how to deal with protective actions, what to do when they get the alert on the phone or over the radio or whatever. And so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping today there might be a small earthquake to, we, and we call this, we call this event-based science. Um, so maybe it will be treated with that. So I'm hoping there's a chance it might happen. So, okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, Emily, do you hope that a saber-toothed tiger will join us today? <laughs> One can always hope. Is this working? Yeah. No, I didn't think so. Let's, it's working? Is this working? Yeah. There you go. Okay. Yeah, right, yeah. Um, 
I actually had a dream that there was a big earthquake last night, so I don't know <laughs> that was related to this conference or not. Um, so I'm the uh, curator and excavation director at the Liberated Heart Pits. I've been here about a year, so I'm also sort of relatively new to Los Angeles. And um, I'm basically in charge of the, all the research programs at the Liberated Heart Pits on the paleontology side, and then also uh, how that research interfaces with the front of house, the education programs and the exhibits, and uh, working closely with the Natural History Museum over here, that's our parent institution. Terrific. So uh, many of us, um, uh, well myself maybe uh, reflect only on my own knowledge, uh, think about the subterranean landscapes of Los Angeles in um, isolated moments, like this conference. I don't generally think about what's underneath us, although if I do, I start to get fascinated and a little frightened about it. Um, but these folks think about subterranean all the time, professionally. Do you, do you find yourselves, I'll just start with Joe, do you find yourself um, underground in your head all the time? Yeah, like, you know, a lot of the time, Mentally, I'm inside an ant colony, imagining I am one of these beetles. <laughs> um, physically, sometimes my head's, you know, several inches under the surface, looking inside these ant colonies, um, often absolutely covered in ants, being annihilated with bites and stings. So yeah, like it's very important for me to venture underground, both uh, mentally and physically. Bob. Well, most people talk about where they live based on streets, and I spent about 20 years living in the Los Feliz Village area, and I used to describe where I lived as being on the hanging wall of the Hollywood Fault. <laughs> and now I've recently moved to the hanging wall of the Santa Monica Fault, so, yes. Yeah. Emily? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, do you spend, um, do you spend most of your, or a lot of your uh, waking hours uh, Figuratively or literally underground? Is it, is it occupy your thoughts, what's beneath us all the time? Yeah, in a way. I mean, I spend a lot of time thinking about the past, and most of the past is underground. Um, and so, uh, you know, both, both in terms of, you know, what that means about where we are today and what that means in terms of where we're going. Um, and certainly, you know, if I've spent a lot of time, say, uh, during a day sorting microfossils or something. When I close my eyes, all I can see is, is microfossils <laughs> behind my lids. So. And you, uh, Emily uh, and Bob and myself were on the um, air talk the other day talking about this conference. And Emily, you said something, which I can't quite remember the quote, but it was something along the lines of most of the past, the human past and the non-human past, is beneath us. It's under the ground. Is it, did you speak in a percentage or did you just say most of it? I, s I said most of it because, um, I mean, a lot of the past never gets preserved. And so, uh, you know, a lot of the past is just gone. But, but that which has been preserved, the vast majority of that is underground. And sure, there's, you know, folding and faulting. And so sometimes you get uplift and you find marine fossils up in the mountains. But, mm. but for the most part, if you want to learn about what's happened long ago, both in human history and natural history, you have to, you have to go underground. All right, terrific. That's a, just the right kind of uh, introduction I wanted you all to get to these uh, experts. And I think with that, Joe, you ready? Yes. Okay, so Joe's going to take us into those um, places. Okay, thank you. We've given Joe, we, can, we couldn't find this a is, pointer. <laughs> so, uh, Actually, a laser, laser pointer. Yeah. So just stand back. Stand back. That's <laughs> the perfect tool for the job. So uh, I, you know, what's that? <laughs> oh, this one. Okay. I don't know if my point will reach. You can use your handheld. There's actually no laser on this. But. Oh. I, I think my. Oh wow! No way. Okay. Could you move the podium on wheels? No. Okay. I'm gonna just make it work like this. All right. Yeah, this is, this is great. Okay, so uh, I've lived here for like three months or something like this, and obviously, you know, it's clear when you move to a place like LA that humans dominate the landscape. There's 19 million human beings in the greater Los Angeles area. That's a huge number. But we share this landscape with another social group of organisms, the ants, that outnumber us by orders of magnitude. Now, I put up this picture here 
of these ants. And you might be able to see, if you stare at it for long enough, that some of these ants look a little bit different to the others. So for example, this guy here, you can see its abdomen is slightly orange. Its body is uh, slightly different, a slightly different shape. That's because this ant here, is this plugged in, Taryn? OK. That ant that I just pointed to is not an ant at all. It's actually a beetle that mimics the ants, looks extremely ant-like, uh, lives amongst, amongst the ants, and is accepted by them as a nest mate, okay? which sounds really, really harmonious, doesn't it? Except for the fact that this beetle feeds on the ants' babies as this fiendishly deceptive colony parasite. <laughs> and I work on these. Uh, I'm just going to like raise my arm if you yeah. need to. like, OK. Excellent, next slide. <laughs> uh, I work on uh, the evolution of this way of life in the beetles, uh, really as a way to understand how animals in general can evolve symbiotic relationships. Now, probably every animal species that we know about is engaged in either a mutualistic or a parasitic association with another animal species. Okay, and these kinds of relationships even extend into the human realm and the parasites that we harbor and the animals we've domesticated. If you think about what a dog is, it's really a symbiotic wolf that lives with a human host. And it's debatable whether it's mutualistic or parasitic in this instance. <laughs> now, <coughs> if you can go to the next slide. Now, uh, there's one group of beetles in particular where we see this symbiotic association evolving with uh, a really high frequency. So there's many, many independent evolutions of this way of life from within one specific group of beetles. And these are the rove beetles, the family Staphylinidae. This is actually the largest family of animals. There's 63,000 species of rove beetles. If you go into any park in, in LA or it, up into the, the foothills of the San Gabriel Mountains, anywhere, you turn over some stones, you will see rove beetles. They're this vast chunk of life on Earth that's really uh, under, un, uh, underexplored. Now, uh, most insects that wander into an ant colony, like this guy here, will be recognized as an intruder and attacked. Okay, because ants have like this uh, chemical mechanism of nest mate recognition involving uh, cuticular hydrocarbons on their body surface. And if your cuticular chemistry doesn't match that of the, you know, the, the nest mates in, in the, in, inside an ant colony, you'll be attacked and dismembered and turned into food. But many times during rove beetle evolution, they've evolved to do something amazing. If you just look at this beetle here that I found the day after I got married in Austin, Texas, <laughs> You can see it's being fed mouth to mouth by this ant. So these ants actually accept this beetle into the nest, recognize it as a nest mate, it's become socially integrated, so essentially assimilated into the uh, life of the colony. And the ants will even pick this beetle up, carry it around the nest, deposit it in the brood galleries where it'll pierce open the ant eggs and suck out the insides. So if you can go to the next slide. So, I study this way of life. It's called myrmecophily, ant-loving. It's really ant-exploitation. It's a really kind of uh, uh, <laughs> a kind of model for how extreme interspecies interactions can evolve to be. The really highly intimate, behaviorally complicated, chemically intricate uh, associations between different species of organisms. Now, can you go back, actually? <laughs> uh, so, and this way of life is right on our doorstep. So, Caltech is here up in Pasadena. A 10-minute car ride up to Eaton Canyon, many of you may have gone hiking around there, you can find this uh, symbiosis playing out uh, on a daily basis. If you just move to the next slide, this ant here is called Lyomotopum occidentalian. If you go to any, anywhere in the kind of uh, foothills surrounding <laughs> us here, you will see this ant in large numbers. It forms gigantic colonies of hundreds of thousands of workers that can form trails up to 80 meters long, and it really is this ecologically dominant organism that controls arthropod populations uh, in the landscape that surrounds us. Now, if you observe one of these colonies for long enough, you might notice insects like this running around. This is actually a species of beetle that lives as one of these socially parasitic symbionts inside colonies of these Lyomotobum ants. I'm going to show you a video I made on my iPhone 6. <laughs> the other day, just to show like how intimate this association is. So you can see this ant here. It's been subdued by these f uh, five beetles, which cr clamber all over it, graze on its surface, 
with their mouth parts. Don't try and attack it at all. They're, so these beetles have managed to uh, chemically manipulate the ant to overcome its natural aggression towards intruders, and they mount the ant and graze on its body surface. And if you, if you uh, uh, zoom in on this interaction, you can see what the beetle actually does is it latches onto the ant's antenna with its mouth parts, okay, and it anchors itself here. And look what it does with its legs. It's actually scraping the surface of the ant and then smearing whatever this stuff is onto its body. So this beetle actually picks up physically the cuticular hydrocarbons from this ant using its legs and smears them over its body so it now matches the chemical code of nest mate recognition of its host ant so it can go undetected inside the nest. It will then be fed mouth to mouth by the worker ants uh, and it can explore the nest and prey on things like the, the brood items and profit from being able to live in this kind of climatically controlled predator free uh, uh, environment. If you look at the beetle's feet, you can see it's got these big brushes of hairs. And these are used to scoop up these uh, long chain uh, 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 cuticular uh, hydrocarbon compounds and smear it onto its body surface. So it's this really specialized way of life as these beetles become adapted to living in ant societies reflected in their, in their external anatomies as well as their behaviors. And one of the most extreme manifestations of this way of life is seen in species that live inside army ant colonies. Now, army ants are, again, very large colony forming ants, ecologically dominant, but don't form permanent nest sites. They forage or emigrate around the, uh, the forest floor, preying on other arthropods, uh, and they're extremely aggressive. So this is a worker army ant here uh, that can really slice your finger open if it, um, if it uh, uh, has the opportunity to. If you watch one of these columns for long enough, these army ant trails for long enough, you'll notice that maybe one in every uh, 1,000 to 2,000 of these ants will actually be a beetle that looks like this. Can you go to the next? This, okay. This is a, uh, actually a beetle species, remarkably ant-like, even more so than the uh, Skeptobius beetle I showed you before. Again, it's not just mimicking the ants, it's socially integrated into this really aggressive army ant, ant, ant society. Um, and so, together with the collaborator, we collected many, many uh, different genera of these uh, ant mimicking uh, species from different army ant colonies that all have this uh, amazing ant-like morphology and sequence their DNA to see how they were related to each other. And this is what we found. Oh, this is actually a picture of me, my hand in a gardening glove trying to collect these beetles. So it's, it can be quite pain, painful work, especially when the ants are, get really agitated. This is what we found. Okay, so uh, all of, this is a, an evolutionary tree here and you can see all of these black lineages these are your standard rove beetles with this kind of normal uh, 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 anatomy here that don't live with ants. And all of these orange uh, little uh, lineages here, these groups, they are all groups which have evolved to live with army ants and assume this ant-like morphology. So you can see evolution playing out repeatedly, <coughs> convergently, many, many times, independently. There are 15 independent origins of these ant-mimicking beetles. And if you just advance to the next... Uh, Thing, you can see each one of these is associated with a single army ant genus. So we have here, by studying this symbiosis, this amazing example of predictable evolution, where every time these beetles have evolved to associate, to become ecologically uh, integrated into army ant societies, their morphology has become extremely ant-like, and aspects of their behavior have also evolved in the same direction. So when people ask you how predictable can biological evolution be, this is probably the best example that we have. It's also an extremely ancient example that's arisen over a 100 million year period. Okay, so what we're interested in the, in the lab is how species like this rove beetle here can evolve to become symbiotic, like these uh, two examples here. And we think one of the key uh, features that kind of predisposes them to engage in ecological interactions with ants is the presence in the ab on the abdomen of a defensive gland. Yes, here. So in this segment here, if you break it open, you find this kind of bag of cells here with this yellow stuff inside. This yellow stuff is benzoquinones, these topical irritants. And most of the, these beetle species, uh, these rove beetles have this, and it enables them to chemically defend themselves against ants. So you can see this beetle here is not a symbiotic species. It's one of these free living ones that you can just find in the dirt. But if ants approach it aggressively, like this one's doing here, it'll loop its abdomen over, 
blast the ants in the face with uh, benzoquinones and, and, uh, and, and this enables it to escape. And so we think that this is kind of the starting conditions for the evolution of the symbiosis. It enables these beetles to wander in, into nests, chemically defend themselves, feed on things inside colonies, and many independent lineages from this kind of incipient starting conditions have then become fully symbiotic. And one of the ways they do this is by changing the chemistry of that gland. So if you go to the next slide, this is a species called Platyusa that you can find at Eaton Canyon. And you can see it's not producing something noxious from its gland anymore. Whatever it's producing, we don't know what this chemical is right now, ants find it extremely attractive. So the beetle essentially uses some kind of appeasement compound, we call it, to distract the ants. Uh, can you go back, please? Uh, to, to, uh, and kind of to play the video. Thank you. Uh, to, to distract the ants, and so it can like essentially bypass their nest mate recognition system and and uh, uh, and live around the ants and feed on the kinds of uh, resources in the nest. You'll also see that this beetle shows no fear towards the ants, so it's actually attracted to the nest. It's really sort of intimately uh, interacting with the ants, and so the evolution of this way of life is in one part chemical through changes in uh, glandular chemistry from ancestral defensive compounds to compounds that are now essentially neuromodulators that manipulate ant behavior. And there are corresponding changes in the behavior of the beetle. They're no longer fearful of the ants. They're actually attracted to them and seek out interactions. And so to cut a long story short, what we're interested in, the lab, in, in, in doing in the lab is understanding the genetic and neurobiological changes in the brain of the beetle that enable it to go from free living to symbiotic, this transition these beetles have done many, many times during evolution, and also the genetic architecture underlying the, uh, uh, the synthesis, the production of chemicals in these glands, which these beetles have uh, been able to modify to enable them to adjust to life inside uh, uh, ant societies. If you can just go to the next slide. So, uh, what we're effectively asking with this uh, beetle system is how one species of organism can evolve the means to uh, recognize and interact effectively with another species of organism, at least partially on the terms of that other species of organism. So by studying this uh, phenomenon in this relatively uh, simple system here, we're studying a phenomenon which has been, lies at the core of all interspecies interactions. If you could just go to the, yeah, so like every time animals forge symbiotic associations with each other, this same phenomenon has been playing out. So by studying it in this relatively simple and beetle system, we're looking at a, a, a process which has really been fundamental to the evolution of the community of interacting organisms that comprise the natural world. And you can see this playing out under LA. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, one quick question for Joe, if you don't mind. Then we'll, we'll have time for questions. Uh, beetles and ants, in your work, taking the place of what we once might have thought would have been fruit fly work? Absolutely. So I trained for 15 years as a drosophilist to be able to transform these beetles into a much more interesting genetic model system uh, that I wanted to kind of, uh, you know, uh, study since I was essentially a, a teenager. Um, and, you know, by learning the, the, the craft of fruit fly genetics, which is this kind of premier model system, um, I've been able to develop species uh, in the laboratory that we can apply the same kind of fruit fly toolkit to, to explore this phenomenon. Now, fruit flies are obviously not symbiotic. They just lay their eggs in fruit. The larvae develop in the fruit. They hatch out. They mate. They lay their eggs in fruit. Like, there's no... <laughs> There's no, there's no real interesting interspecies interactions, especially anything as complicated as this with fruit flies. So to understand this kind of phenomenon, you have to develop new model systems. And we're at the stage now where modern genetic tools are becoming available that enable us to answer these questions outside of standard uh, model species like you know, fruit flies, mice, zebrafish, your, your standard laboratory uh, uh, organisms. Great. Thank you. Bob, can we turn it over to you for seismology? You're up. Thank you. So 
all of you hopefully grabbed a copy of this. It, it would be pretty sad if there were an earthquake today and a lot of us were killed as a result. It would be bad PR for the USGS. <laughs> and so there is step number five of uh, seven steps to earthquake safety, drop, carbon, hold on. Those are great chairs, by the way, and this building is very safe. But I, I'm compelled to say such a thing. Um, one thing I wanted to start with is under LA, is a very noisy place. And I don't think we can see quite the entire slide there. Is there a way to get it to, to show up? But we're seeing um, what, uh, what is happening currently in real time. And this, uh, what this is is a, a seismometer, which is, uh, well, let's see, what's there? Let's try it again. Ah, whoop. Can you get it? Not working. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, well that's fine. All right, maybe we can tr try it. Well, try it. See, we'll see what happens. Uh, and then go up and do the 2D. That would be great. 2D. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Ah, so LA under LA is a noisy place. And so what you're seeing is what's happening now. The ground is moving as as we sit here. And so when you, how many of you felt an earthquake in your most of you have, right? Yeah, I, I suppose you have. And the whole notion is, is that uh, we have 20 to 30 earthquakes a day in Southern California, 50 a day in California. And so what you feel typically is probably pretty complex and pretty chaotic, and it's hard to make sense of it. And the device, a small seismometer that I have actually taped to the floor back turn is it's about the size of a cigarette, or I'd rather a cigarette, but a, uh, a bat box of matches. And it's unpacking, it's, it's separating the different components. So let's, let's do, I, I know that some of you, I don't know if you're destined after this conference to go do your workout for the day, your core workout. We can get a little bit of a core workout right now if you like. Um, well, actually, we'll just use your legs. So everybody on the count of three, what I'd like you to do is stomp your feet on the floor. See if we can make a quake. Wait, no, so, so don't stomp yet. Actually, let's do this. Uh, lift your feet off of the ground. Good, good for the abs. And then, and then, on the count of three, I want you to stomp as hard as you can on the ground. So ready, one, two, and three. And there's your quake. So you move the ground up and down, forward and back, and side to side. And so I've, I've spent a lot of time in, in my bio installing these little sensors in schools around the country to catch real earthquakes. It's called the Quake Catcher Network, and uh, we've, we've had a lot of fun with this. So if we could go to the slide set, please, that would be terrific. And. Uh, this is actually one of my favorite images, the first image that's going to come up from now a, a defunct uh, Weekly World News. So this is after the Northridge earthquake. I thought this was appropriate, especially from one of the film clips that was shown where people are falling into the depths of hell. And so... Where the Beatles are. Where the Beatles are, exactly, yes. <laughs> right, right below Caltech. Um, <laughs> So uh, if we go back, one, go back to the slide again really quick. This is actually was published just after, in February of 1994, just after the Northridge earthquake. Then many of you were in the area at the time. So if we go to the next slide. So this is the, uh, a, a screenshot from a USGS uh, Caltech page which shows the number of earthquakes. And I said earlier, 20 to 30 earthquakes a day and 50 or so in California. It's events that are happening all the time. This is actually one of the compelling reasons why we would want to in involve students. There's a next generation science standards that are being used in schools now and, and it's, it's, it gives students an opportunity to interact with real earthquakes and what to do with them and, and to come to terms with them. So one of the ways is that we can't prevent earthquakes. They're going to continue to happen regardless, but we figure out ways to deal with them and one of them is to prepare. So you have your little handbook to prepare for earthquakes. We also do something called a great shakeout every year on the third Thursday of October to practice what to do when you feel the shaking. But someday, it won't be just the shaking that tells you to do something about it, but maybe a signal that comes over your telephone or another device that says an earthquake is approaching, do something about it. So next slide, please. So this image is actually in your booklet on page two, Great Earthquakes in California, the one and uh, purposely used Trojan colors down there on the bottom. So if you're from UCLA, you're out of luck. And the, uh, the, the interesting thing about this is the origin of a shakeout came from that segment in the far south near the Salton Sea. Typically these big earthquakes happen in, on the order of an average of 150 years. And so that southernmost segment hasn't had an earthquake in over 300 years, 
which is troubling and is the source of the big one or the, the great shakeout scenario that we've been talking about. The card, oh, come back, go back, please. The gold colored uh, uh, stripe there is the last big high magnitude seven earthquake in Southern California that happened 160 years ago, the, um, the Fort Tejon earthquake. And so this, is, uh, this affected the entire region. Next slide. So one of the themes I want to bring up today is that we're caught in the crunch. We have a tectonic traffic jam here in Southern California. Is that it turns out, if you go back to the previous slide really quickly, please, the San Andreas Fault's about 800 miles long. And in sort of just a little bit east of here, in the Eagle Mountains, out to the Channel Islands, go forward to the slide, we have something that's a, a very technical term that you'll have a hard time remembering. We have something called the Big Bend in the Big Bend, remember that, in the San Andreas Fault. And that Big Bend has caused this tectonic traffic jam to occur. It's where the region is actually being squished. So the Palos Verdes Peninsula, who knows where that is, that thing's sticking out at the LA Harbor over there, and Mount Wilson in the San Gabriel Mountains are getting closer to one another every day. And so we're caught in the crunch. So this actually, the next shot uh, shows a, a, a better picture of it taken from a colleague of mine, Mike Reimer, a USGS geologist, uh, uh, did a little bit of work on a, on a mission, on an image taken by the space shuttle, and uh, showing you a picture of how this plays out. So in the segment here, this is where we are, Eagle Mountains here, Channel Islands all the way out here. So this is where this tectonic traffic jam is occurring, and literally we're getting stuck. So next slide, please. So what has happened is, and the best analogy I like to use is the shattered windshield. Everybody here has seen a shattered windshield or had one happen. If you want to go get a shattered windshield today just to see what it's like, go drive up and down the 605 freeway, and there are lots of gravel trucks. And you'll see that uh, there's a lot, uh, a lot of chances of seeing that sort of shattered effect that occurs. And um, the, what this has grown to or what this has caused is a, a shattering effect across the basin and given rise to hundreds of faults. And one of them happens to be about two miles under our feet, dipping at a, about 27 degree angle towards San Gabriel Mountains called the Puente Hills Thrust. So right here at USC, we have a really big fault right under our feet, about two miles below us, and many hundreds around us. So there's a lot, lot to see. And um, this actually is one of the biggest challenges associated with early warning, is that we have so many sources of earthquakes in Southern California. Next slide. So I want to show a little video, because how did things get this way? Don't play it yet. But I want to point out, this is San Diego. This is actually Santa Barbara. But what I want to show you, this is 20 million years ago, and, and actually this, this fits pretty well with some of the stuff with the Liberia Tar Pits later on because the source of a lot of our petroleum products in the basin came from this process. It turns out that about 15 million years ago, in a time period called the Miocene, um, this region shifted where the whole region just rotated uh, uh, clockwise. And so go ahead and play the video for me, please. And so see 18, you notice, see this rotation here? So this rotation gave rise to the Big Bend. And you notice these, these sort of grayish areas here, those are, those are basins forming. And one of the challenges in, in, in this area is that we have regions that uh, are underlain by deep basins, many miles deep. So underneath our feet here, there's several miles, up to two miles because there's the fault surface below us, of, of, of sediment. And that actually has some interesting effects. The deepest part of the basin is where 105 and uh, 110 cross, about five miles deep. So we, and, and these, these basins have given rise to our oil riches in Southern California, but also have caused an interesting complication with earthquakes. Turns out, and I think if we go to the next slide, I believe that's, what, oh, that's not what shows. But a little bit later on, I'll show a slide that actually shows these deep basins and what the consequences are. But you can find faults at your, in your backyard, in your front yard here in, in the LA area. Uh, if you go to JPL, one of my favorite sites, I believe the, this Gould Mesa here was pushed upward by the Sierra Madre Fault, which is found at the ba base of the San Gabriel Mountains here. In fact, the San Gabriel Mountains is this gigantic upthrust uh, unit that's been pushed all the way up. So you're looking at something that used to be in ground level and was pushed upward. It's an interesting area. 
Uh, and it turns out, I believe uh, one of the strands of the fault here runs right through the Earth Science Building at JPL. But don't tell my JPL colleagues about that. They might get a little angry. But this is a place to actually go see it. Next slide. Capitol Records Building. See this little hill here? This is Hollywood and Vine. If you look up the who, see a hill there. In fact, if you drive roughly from Franklin Avenue, say at Vermont, all the way to the west, as you're going towards, towards, High, towards Highland, you'll see a series, and, but keep your eyes on the road, please. But if you look off to the south, you'll see these little hills. And these are fault scarps. These are hills that are produced by earthquakes that are pushed up. And this is evidence. So the uh, Capitol Records building sits on top of a fault scarp uh, from the Hollywood Fault. Next slide. And so one of the best landscape Escaped fault scarps in the world is the Los Angeles Latter-day Saint, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Temple. Um, and it sits on top of a scarp uh, that has um, been pushed up by the Santa Monica Fault. And this is uh, at Overland and, uh, and Santa Monica Boulevard. And one other thing about a theme related to this, and I think City Hall in Los Angeles follows that same suit, Pasadena City Hall as well, is that we have structures that are built deep into underground, but it turns out that the Mormon Temple and City of Los Angeles uh, City Hall and also Pasadena City Hall have decoupled, have tried to separate themselves from underground by taking, uh, digging a hole all the way around the perimeter and underneath the building and jacking that building up and decoupling it from the surface by putting rubber bearings. So what will happen is as the ground shakes, the building itself will not shake in in concert with the ground, it'll actually move much, much more slowly. And so, of course, there's a safety reason for this. And so the, 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 the future of religion on Earth is, is going to survive. <laughs> and also the future of the, of the city is also going to survive, as you can imagine. So this is a safety reason. So if we go to the next slide, please. This is the picture that I promised to show earlier. This is a, an image, and this is a slide from uh, my former uh, employer, the Southern California Earthquake Center here at USC. Um, shows you the depth of the basins, and this very, very deep part of the basin here is, is uh, the, de the, the greatest depth is the 105-110 uh, intersection. But one of the big challenges with having deep basins in, in this area is that seismic waves, they produce wonderful valleys, or they have wonderful valleys, but the problem is, is that when seismic waves hit these, these regions, they slow down and they get bigger. So in other words, you get these interesting uh, amplification effects that occur in these regions. So that's one of the challenges. Next slide, please. So uh, it wouldn't be a complete presentation if we did not destroy Los Angeles. We have to do something to it. So I'm going to play. Uh, thank you for starting it. So this is the big one. This is an earthquake that starts down at the Salton Sea. You can see, can see it coming up over the surface into downtown LA. These are the P waves traveling about 13,000 miles per hour, the S waves behind them traveling about 6,500 miles per hour. And uh, this is the big one. This is the, the simulated big one. It's not the earthquake that's going to happen. It's an earthquake that can happen. But you can see it coming over the uh, mountains here to the east. And we're here in, say, downtown Los Angeles, or actually we're just south of downtown, somewhere between here and I-10. And now we've felt the earthquake. And this, this is the first sort of bumpity, bumpity, bumpity that we get from the earthquake from the P waves. And here's the, here's the big stuff coming over the hill here. And this, uh, this, this is showing the amount of shaking that's going on. It's what you actually feel for everybody. This is a magnitude 7.8 earthquake. But the shaking, of course, differs, well, differs by three things, the size of the earthquake, how far you're away from the earthquake rupture, and what kind of ground is underneath you. And so here we go. So if this were to happen today, we would be, look at that, it's like a wave of water coming through. It's pretty, pretty crazy stuff. And you may have seen these simulations. Now, mind you, this is a thousand times exaggeration in the vertical, so not to worry, you're not going, we're not, he, we here at Doheny Library are not going to be thrown into the air by 30 or 40 feet. But this is what's happening in this process. Of course, the shaking here in the basin will last somewhere in the order of two and a half minutes. So something to look forward to, everyone. But one thing I want to point out is you see that this red, the most shaking, the highest uh, shaking level, is found along the fault itself, which makes a lot of sense. 
but you'll notice that that red also spreads its way into other areas. And what are what do you think those areas are? The basins. Great. So you've so so the deep basins slow down these seismic waves and the shaking increases. So the analogy to use for downtown Los Angeles is a bowl of jello. So go home today, get one of those big plastic bowls, buy a plastic mallet, get a crap load of jello, put it into a container, set it up, and then hit the side of it with the mallet and the the jello will go boop, 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 back and forth. It really does make that sound, believe me, it does. And that's what'll happen. So um, that's uh, that's really all I have to say. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> I think I've said it all. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, so Bob noted that um, the seismology and the seismic uh, realities of Los Angeles are tied very intricately to the seeps and the asphalt and the La Brea tar pits, which is the perfect segue to Emily Lindsay. So Emily, can you come on up and join us? Thank you. This one? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, I was just saying, I, I don't have any, any cool videos because everything I work on is dead. But um, <laughs> I've got uh, just, just a few slides. So uh, first slide, please. Um, so I said, as I said before, most of the past is underground. And another way of looking at, at that is that most of what we see today on Earth is just a tiny fraction of what has been. And so, for instance, this is a diagram of uh, the large cats that we have at the La Brea Tar Pits. And um, in Los Angeles today, we have, we have one large cat, and in fact, exactly one large cat. His name is P-22, and he lives in Griffith Park, feasting on uh, deer and raccoons and occasionally koalas from the LA Zoo. But uh, in the past in LA, we know that uh, there were at least five species of big cats until not very long ago, until about 10 or 15,000 years ago. There were, um, of course, the famous saber-toothed cat, uh, California state fossil. There was actually a second type of saber-toothed cat called Homotherium or the scimitar cat. There was American lion, which is the largest cat that's ever lived, uh, similar to the cave lion in Europe. Um, there was an extinct uh, subspecies of jaguar, and then and then also mountain lions, and and we know this, uh, and we only know this because we find them underground. They're they're under LA, um, and and this is true of a lot of things. And and when we think about the world we're living in today, and especially in a place like Los Angeles, it's a very it's a world that's been heavily modified in a very recent span of time. So we know that the, what we see today isn't, isn't natural and isn't necessarily representative of what might be kind of a baseline ecosystem. And in fact, studies indicate that uh, the, for about the past 50 million years, there's been this kind of normal size distribution of mammals. And so if you were to go uh, think about an African ecosystem today, that type of ecosystem where there's a large number of large-bodied mammals was actually very typical for all continents on Earth until about uh, between 10 and 50,000 years ago, depending on where you look. Um, and so what we see today is just, uh, it's, a, it's a strong departure from that pattern. And we know this because we've looked underground. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, so I work at the La Brea Tar Pits and these are a phenomenal site to reconstruct the past ecosystems of LA. And this is for a few reasons. First of all, asphaltic seeps in general, and there's about a dozen tar pits in the world that contain fossils. Um, this is one of the richest ones, and it's certainly the best studied, but 
There's a couple of others in Southern California. There's a few in Northwestern South America, Peru, Ecuador, Venezuela. There's a, a handful in the Caribbean, uh, Cuba and Trinidad. And then there's one we know of in Azerbaijan. And there may well be more on Earth that haven't been discovered yet. But in terms of being able to do really large scale paleontological research, the La Brea Tar Pits, by virtue of their being in the middle of the third biggest city in North America, and having been discovered over 100 years ago and excavated and studied more or less continuously since then, offers really the best opportunity for understanding what this area and, and much of the world really looked like in the not so distant past. Um, and this is for a few reasons. First of all, asphalt is a phenomenal preservative and uh, bo it both accumulates and preserves vast quantities of paleontological material. And so this is, if anyone's been to the Liberia Tar Pits, you probably recognize this image. This is a, a portion of our direwolf wall, which is a wall that contains 404 skulls of direwolves that have been found from the Liberia Tar Pits, which again is a very small fraction of what we have. We probably have over 5,000 direwolves rec represented at the Liberia Tar Pits. We have over 2,500 saber-toothed cats represented at the Liberia Tar Pits. And so, just huge, huge quantities of animals that have been buried and preserved here. Um, and that's because uh, the asphalt both uh, entrapped organisms, sort of actively and passively trapped organisms, and uh, because it then was able to preserve them. And so in tar pit sites, what you find are representatives of communities that you tend not to find in other paleontological deposits. So it's very unusual, for instance, to find both bones and plant material in the same paleontological site because the type of sediment that preserves one tends to dissolve the other. It's also relatively unusual to find large material, say large bones and, and small fossils in the same site uh, because the types of pathways to deposition and preservation tend to be different. So you may find a lot of large vertebrate bones in uh, bone beds that are the production of, of river activity, fluvial activity. So they may be deposited and washed down in a riverbed, and a lot of that smaller stuff has been washed away. And concurrently, uh, small material often is found in, uh, in large accumulations in midden assemblages in caves, so pack rat middens or raptor middens, where these forces are accumulating the small fossils, the small birds, the rodents, the reptiles, small plant material, but you're not going to get the larger animals there. But the tar pits have both. The tar pits also, because of asphalt's special preserving properties, can preserve material that just doesn't get preserved at all most of the time. We have insect material, we have soft tissues of plants, and bone collagen all of which permit not only the detailed study of these organisms, but also uh, new molecular analyses as technology is advancing. So radiocarbon dating, stable isotope analysis, protein analysis, people are now actively working on trying to get DNA out of these fossils. And so the opportunity uh, that one has at the tar pits to look at essentially an entire ecosystem uh, captured in time is really kind of a, a once in the world unique opportunity. Can I have the next si slide, please? And it's not just those large animals that I talked about and that most people think of when they think of the Librea tar pits, the saber toothed cats and dire wolves and the mammoths and the mastodons and the giant ground sloths, which are my favorite. Um, but also these small things. Uh, so that top image there is a can of, of what we call matrix. So this is uh, all of the dirt that's been excavated out of these tar pits along with the large bones. The large bones were sent to the lab and prepared and this, and this matrix, this dirt, was then washed to get the asphalt off of it, um, washed in particular solvents, and, and dried. And what you're left with is uh, uh, buckets and buckets and buckets of gravels and plant parts and, and small things. And here on the bottom, uh, Joe, we've got some insect material. <laughs> Which Amanda? Holden. Oh, Anna, Anna Holden. Is it? Anna. Okay. Okay. I'm Facebook friends with her. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Yeah, no, so she, she's, that's actually from one of her papers. So um, we have a, a, a chitin, insect chitin that's preserved in the tar pits and hundreds of species of insects. We also have um, uh, other invertebrates, bivalves and, and snails that can tell us not only what the ecosystem was like, but actually if you uh, look at the uh, carbonate, the isotopes in the carbonate, those, those can actually give you a direct estimate of temperature and precipitation in the past. So we can use these types of materials to do really fine scale ecological analyses. And these small fossils, these microfossils as we call them, are really important because whereas you know Colombian mammoths were found over most of North America, a lot of these species of insects and rodents and lizards are particular to very specific ecosystems. And so if we want to understand what Los Angeles looked like 10,000 years ago, 25,000 years ago when half of North America was covered in ice, 40,000 years ago before the ice really advanced, this is the type of material that can give us that information. And the uh, time period that the Liberia Tar Pits covers is a really, really important time period for understanding <coughs> what's happening, not only what happened a long time ago, but what's happening today. Because that time period, those last 50,000 years, covers the last major episode of global warming, the arrival and expansion of humans in North America, and the disappearance of about 80% of large mammals from California ecosystems and the rest of the world. And so, as conservation biologists are starting to ask questions about um, what might be happening in the future and how best to preserve biodiversity and species and ecosystem function in the future, a lot of scientists are now starting to look to the past to understand how these species have responded to past episodes of climate change and past human impacts and the loss of uh, specific species from their ecosystems. Next slide, please. So, um, and as, uh, as Bob was talking about earlier, and as, as Bill referenced as well, the uh, tar pits are intimately tied with the underground geology and seismology of Los Angeles. So this wonderful video that Bob showed of the development of the Los Angeles Basin and the, the Big Bend and the fault, that, um, that time period between uh, 10 and 20 million years ago, uh, Los Angeles actually until very recently was, was underwater. And uh, a few million years ago, as the, as the basin formed, there were these microorganisms in the water called diatoms. And as those microorganisms lived and died, their bodies accumulated on the floor of the LA basin underwater. And those were subsequently covered by layer upon layer of sediment. And those sediments pushed the basin further down. It's a process called subsidence. And the heat and pressure from having those overlying layers at that depth converted the bodies, the organic matter in the bodies of these diatoms to oil. And so if you look at a map of Los Angeles produced by a petroleum company, what you see are not the neighborhoods and the freeways, you see the different oil fields that this region lies over. And so the region that, um, the oil field that the Liberate Tar Pits is on top of is called the Salt Lake Oil Field. And again, because this is such a tectonically active area, there are a number of faults, and there's one uh, small fault called the Sixth Street Fault that runs right through the Liberate Tar Pits. And so the oil from these millions of year old microorganisms uh, is able to seep up there to the surface and spread out. And I actually, one of the excavators at the tar pits refers to it as the zombie diatoms. These are diatoms that died a long time ago and now they are coming back to the surface and trapping animals and plants that are living today and bringing them down with them. So uh, that's all I've got. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, fabulous start. What I'd like to do is ask each of our scientists briefly if they have questions for one another or comments for one another before I open it up to you all for questions and comments. Anything from you all? Joe. I've got a question for each of you. Uh, so how old are the like San Gabriel Mountains? And I ask this because I'm interested in how 
the interaction between the beetles and the ants has like uh, how the two things have speciated over evolutionary time and there, whether there are barriers to gene flow. And I need to know how old the, these you know, barriers may be to be able to kind of infer how ancient these relationships might be and how old the divergences between different populations are. Well, the Sengirbal Mountains, the rocks themselves are much older, but the actual building of the Sengirbal Mountains, they, they continue to grow. And that's this process of compression that's going on across the basin continues as, as, as we speak. Um, but it's something in the order of five million years old. The, okay, the so that's themselves. quite, yes. actually relatively recent in evolutionary terms. Absolutely, but, yes. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, and a question for you, like you mentioned uh, getting molecules out of these uh, uh, specimens. Has that been successful? I, I, and I ask specifically for, for insects. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, so, so Anna, the researcher you mentioned, she's um, recently published a couple of papers where they've radiocarbon dated about 200 insects. So certainly from the perspective of dating, we're able to get very accurate dates. Now, I don't know that uh, anyone's tried to do stable isotopic analysis on those and with regard to DNA, that's what I would, there's yeah. well, so there's an active project right now on on bones. Nobody has ever successfully gotten DNA out of asphalt impregnated bones, and we're not sure if that's because the asphalt itself is degrading the DNA or the processes and chemicals that we use to get the asphalt out degrades the DNA. So we're trying different techniques like. Uh, not heating the solvent when we take the bones out or not using solvent or using different solvents. But mm -hmm. so far, um, I don't have any uh, exciting data to report on that. But, but proteomics, protein analysis, right. is um, there's an active project on that, and it's looking a little bit more promising. So is there a precedent from other, uh, you know, tar pit kinds of fossil beds for being able to get, like, ancient biomolecules like this? No, no, nowhere. Um, and, and if it's been tried anywhere, it's probably been tried at the Liberia Tar Pits. Can I ask, is there a, a correlation between international or global tar pits and Mediterranean climates? Um, not that I know of. I think, I think the two things you need for, for tar pits are you need, well, maybe three things. So you need, you need oil underground. You need a way for that oil to get to the surface. So you need tectonics. Um, and you need it to be not too terribly cold, I guess, would be the third one, because the asphalt, you know, when it's very cold, the asphalt doesn't, um, it's not sticky. It doesn't trap much. And in fact, we seem to see this hiatus right around the last glacial maximum about, you know, 25 to 20,000 years ago when it was at its coldest. There's not a lot of uh, specimens from the tarpets that have been dated to that time, probably because they were not as actively trapping. And even on an annual basis, the tarpets are still active today. They're still trapping on a daily basis uh, plants and insects and occasionally birds and squirrels. And we see a lot more entrapment during the summertime than we do in the winter, just because the, the asphalt is warmer, it's stickier. Can you tell us about the human remain? Remains? Uh, we have one human skeleton from the tar pits. Her, she's named La Brea Woman. She's about 9,000 years old. She was found in pit 10, which is uh, dated to, it has radiocarbon dates ranging from at least about 15,000 to about 6,000 years old, or actually less, less than 6,000 years old, because there's a dog that was a domestic dog that was found there as well. And for many years, there was a story that, oh, she was a, a burial and it was a, her dog was buried with her. But they, last year we dated the dog and the dog's only about 3,000 years old. So it was not her dog. <laughs> okay, so um, by all means, let's uh, open up to you all. Um, please, to the best of your ability, keep your questions short so we can hear from as many people as possible before we take our break, before we come back to the next one. Yes, sir. Yes, I And I'll repeat the question just so I can Two, two questions. Um, the first one uh, regarding the, the depth of the basins. Um, the landscape seems pretty level to me, so five miles is quite deep. So what, what are you referring to when you say that the basins are five miles deep? Is that basalt layer or? So the question is, uh, given that what seems to be the flat surface of the basin, uh, what is it that constitutes these basins that Bob talked about that can deep, deepen down five miles? So during the animation I showed where the stretching of the 
Southern California region occurred and basically big holes opened up, a very simple model. The process of weathering and erosion brought materials to fill in those spaces over time. The process of, of stuff going in and then causing subsidence that Emily was mentioning. So what defines them, and actually they're much like the people who are the petroleum engineers to find these regions and they are able to see uh, these these re these basins in many different places based on soundings that they take of the of, of the take a sense of the depth. So, and second question. Go ahead. Sure. How can I get rid of those fire ants from my garden? <laughs> <laughs> you well, hear that? How first can we all, get rid of the fire ants from your garden? You've got Argentine ants, <laughs> probably not. Oh, unless you have a native species of fire ant, in which case you should leave them alone. But like <laughs> the, the fire ant problems, like Florida to Texas, and this is a also from Argentina, don't know why, uh, 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 invasive ant species has come up. It's quite actually quite rare in Argentina, but here, you know, it's got no natural enemies. Um, some genetic changes have happened that enabled it to form these huge super colonies. Um, and it's like, uh, you know, wiping out other native ant species. Um, an interesting thing about both the Argentine ant that we get around here and the um, uh, Argentinian fire ant that you get in Texas is that they've brought up some of these beetles from their native habitats with them. So in the case of the fire ant, there's this uh, amazing beetle called Myrmecosaurus. This is this awesome like armored rove beetle that lives in the fire ant colonies and uh, is accepted by these you know really aggressive nasty uh, fire ants. From Argentina, from its native range, it's known from about seven specimens, so it's vanishingly rare. But every fire ant colony you break into in Texas has multiple of these beetles. So almost everything we know about this beetle symbol comes from studying it within its native range. And there's a, um, uh, to like get back to your que like original question, that there is a group at uh, UT Austin, like an invasive ant group, exploring the potential of uh, um, these uh, like intruder arthropods like beetles and flies that parasitize these colonies as a method for biological control it appears to be having some kinds of success so yeah like Emily oh Joe I just have a question for you about um, you know there's there's been a lot of focus for many years now on on invasive species but it's usually focused on either terrestrial species or marine species but I know that there's a lot of these subterranean species that come up and in fact I, we moved here from the Bay Area recently mm -hmm. and I used to get the Argentine ants coming into my kitchen during oh, the yeah. rainy season every year it drove me crazy and I yeah, was yeah. just desperately looking online for anything to do about it and I came across this article from it was like 19 07 or something from the uh, Oakland newspaper of the first report of Argentine oh, yeah. ants in <clears throat> in Oakland or Berkeley and uh, so I, I've always thought of this type of migration as sort of a relatively recent thing but apparently it goes back over a hundred years and I'm just wondering what you know is the is the underground sort of as cosmopolitanized a as the overground? Oh, is absolutely. Now? Even more so. Like leaf litter, like soil environment, is where almost all of life is. You know, you have these vast, gigantic, like species rich groups of organisms, things like mites, nematodes, rove beetles, that are hugely unexplored, neglected by most biologists, but account for, you know, the vast majority of, of 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 living living species. So, and that's only you know within the animal kingdom. So, uh, the same thing, you know, in rainforest ecosystems, there's been such a focus on canopy species, and canopy research, that like as if that's where most of life is. The the you know the the leaf litter uh, fauna is just as rich, or presu uh, like. Possibly like several times richer than anything going up in, in uh, going on in the canopy. So you know it's real sort of frontier of biology. What's happening in the in the leaf litter and soil? And how much is known about the impact that that has on sort of the the bigger terrestrial flora and fauna that that we tend to be more focused on? Yeah, I would say those kinds of studies are uh, in their infancy. Um, you know when we monitor you know, ecological change and like anthropogenic effects on the environment. It's always looking at charismatic megafauna. So things like, you know, mammals and birds, like very species, poor groups. Uh, and uh, and uh, like if invertebrates at all get a look in, it's things like butterflies, which again are quite very species, poor groups. So what's really going on in, you know, terrestrial ecosystems, 
like a real barometer for that would be studying these, you know, mi you know, microarthropods that live in the soil. They're probably extremely sensitive and probably more kind of fundamentally uh, integral to the functioning of these ecosystems. So we need more people being able to identify them and study them to really be able to gauge what's going on. Um, really, you know, it, 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 in many different kinds of habitats. Yes. So the question is, uh, is it random or otherwise that uh, many of the earthquakes seem to be concentrically removed from downtown or the centers of population in Southern California? And do they seem to come in intervals of 18 to 20 years or thereabouts? So we have many, many more small earthquakes and we have big earthquakes. So for every magnitude 5, there are 10 magnitude 4s and 100 magnitude 3s and 1,000 magnitude 2s. So the bigger earthquakes are less frequent. So you'll get, say, a northridge size earthquake about once every 30 years or so. And so we are awaiting another one. Uh, about the idea of, of earthquakes, sort of that LA is sort of a safe area as opposed to other areas, just give it some time. We'll, we'll get our own very soon. So. OK. David. notion was that um, yeah, at a certain point it would begin to pattern would be random, would appear to be random, and right at the northern edge of that, um, of that, of that window there was another earthquake in Parkville. So I, I, it's not really a scientific question, but it always struck me that earthquakes were, um, they defy our attempts, not that they're conscious exactly, but that they defy our attempts to define them in some sense, right? We could say that there's no earthquake, it hasn't been an earthquake in downtown Los Angeles because of San Andreas is 50 miles away, but as Mike Davis once said, essentially all of Los Angeles is epicentral because they're all <coughs> falsehood under, under life. So I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about maybe the, you know, what we might call earthquake mysticism or the notion that earthquakes kind of um, defy our attempts to, to, to define them in some sense. Everyone hear that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Bob? So there, there is, there's we're always the chance for us to try to find patterns and the Parkfield question is very interesting. I was actually fortunate enough to be in Parkfield for the 2004 earthquake. So I, get, I had my very own, my very first San Andreas earthquake. I'm very proud of it. I was actually standing on a platform that was studying the San Andreas. I was about 30 feet off the ground and I felt the earthquake. It was fantastic. <laughs> and so the issue with Parkfield is interesting. In a recent talk given by, by Lucy Jones, many of you know who she is, uh, about uh, her work uh, with the city of Los Angeles, um, really reflected on the statistics that were done with Parkfield in the 20-year cycle. And, and there was a real flaw in, in this notion of confirmation bias, that she was in a community of people that saw the 20-year cycle, and they all lived in that confirmation bias, so the statistics and the analysis seemed to point that direction. So we try to find these patterns. One of the biggest challenges with finding these large-scale patterns with earthquakes is that we've only been at it in terms of recording data for about 100 years. And so we're still a long way off. A lot of it has to do with time. The best we can do is, is forecasting earthquakes, much like a weather forecast, a certain percentage of time, when a uh, certain, certain amount of time before we get uh, the next magnitude X earthquake, say over the next 30 years or the next 100 years. But that's about the best we can do. But getting that earthquake, the size of the earthquake, the location, and the date, um, down to that, to that, you know, when it's going to happen, we just haven't realized that. So I don't know if that gets at your question exactly, David, but, but I just... David, you had another one. Yeah, for Emily, I just, it's sort of, I'm always interested in the intersection of myth and reality, so I'm curious about La Brea Woman. Um, uh, Amy Wentz has 
written about her, I've written about her, we both described her as, um, or referred to her as, say, Los Angeles County's first murder victim. Uh, <laughs> but I, I understand there may be some, um, that, that story may actually be more complicated than it appears, right? The, the, the skull, she suffered blunt force trauma of some, of some sort of, uh, in the skull. So I wonder if you can talk about the current thinking of what the fate of La Brea woman was. How she ended up in how she ended up in the asphalt. You know, I, I think it's far from conclusive. And to be honest, there hasn't been a great deal of study on her uh, in the last couple of decades because of um, the uh, concerns around handling of indigenous human remains. And um, we haven't really had like an archaeologist sort of specializing in, in local NAGPRA issues for quite a while. We just hired one who will be coming on in January, and so I think starting then there may be kind of a renewed focus on La Brea woman and the archaeology of the La Brea Tar Pits in general. We have about 100 artifacts there, plus uh, the domestic dog, and I expect if people bothered to look, we would have a lot of sort of interesting, more recent types of artifacts as well. People... If you read books or articles, people say, oh, the La Brea Tar Pits cover a time from about 40,000 years ago to 11,000 years ago, or from about 50,000 years ago to 5,000 years ago. But actually, they, they cover a time from about at least 50,000 years ago to now. Uh, and they're continually uh, con concentrating material, and, and we continually have new seeps uh, sort of erupting in the park all the time, and and they're still capturing a record of nature and humanity going into the future. And there's this this talk now about a discussion among scientists: Are we in this new geological epoch called the Anthropocene or the Anthropocene? And and if we are, we have you know a, a ongoing record of the Anthropocene being accumulated today. We have these cosmopolitan or invasive or introduced species. We have domesticated uh, animal species. We have domesticated plant species, all the foods that humans have brought in. We have human trash being accumulated in, in the tar pits. And, and we have human trash uh, going back at least, well, at least 9,000 years. So I think it'll be interesting to see you know, in the coming few years, what types of new research gets Keith. looked at. <laughs> Thanks so much for mentioning the Anthropocene. We've talked about yes, this hi. previously. Hi, again. Uh, this in part brings me to a question that your talk brought up a lot, but that I think in Bob's talk and really in Joe's, there's a lot of questions as well, which is if we think about what's under LA, it can be easy to detach it from the human processes on the surface. And so the USGS had a paper last year on whether or not oil extraction in Long Beach might have contributed to earthquakes in Southern California. So I wonder if all of you could maybe think a bit about whether or not there's a clear dividing line between human and anthropogenic processes under LA, or whether we should think about under LA as a place that should be entwined with its human history, as well as with its natural history. Everyone hear the question? Yep. I would say, like, when it comes to insect life, it's largely, impo it's really impossible to think about the native fauna of LA, you know, uh, within the confines of the, of, of uh, uh, the, the, the city. Almost all of the insect species well, a vast majority of them are probably invasive, okay, you know, especially so soil-dwelling things. A lot of aerial insects, like, you know, flying things are still d dispersing in and they'll be native. But, like, things that are with limited mobility, when human settlement, you know, sp spread out in this area, a lot of things that would, weren't so mobile will have gone extinct. And so if you find things uh, uh, living in soil that have like such li limited sort of virgility like that it's they're probably uh non-native so to give a give a, a comparable example i collected beetles for years in central park and uh, rove beetles and almost all of them were species that were originally described from europe okay so none of the species you get there are actually north american uh, native species and i should imagine and obviously you know the, the the number one insect you find around here is the linopithema, like the Argentine ant. This is you know, 
just completely wiped out presumably so many other native species and just dis displaced them. Um, and the same is probably true of other, you know, microarthropods in, in soil and litter. So, you know, I would say it's only among the kind of mobile, aerial, flying things that kind of get attracted to light and what have you, still filtering in from surrounding areas and like clinging on in a few strongholds around the city that, that you could really count as being native. So it's a massively skewed uh, 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 insect fauna that you see around the city. Of course, as soon as you go outside into the mountains, this is still pretty wildernessy. So, you know, uh, the native fauna there, at least you know, a certain distance from from civilization, starts to take on its kind of nat natural form. Um, so, unlike a lot of the you know the megafauna, the vertebrates, you know, that have gone extinct, like presumably among the insect fauna, things are still a little bit more resi resilient. So we haven't really hunted ants to extinction, like <laughs> Bob and Emily. <coughs> Well, of course, the the paleontology story of the year that everyone here is so excited about are the, the subway finds, the, the fossils in the subway. So we had a mammoth skull from the La Brea and Wilshire station on display in our fossil lab for a while. They found bits of giant ground sloth and camel. And so I think there you have this this intersection of sort of the past, and not just the present, but the past and the future, right? This is a subway tunnel and station that's not even going to be used for several years. And it's discovering things that happened in LA tens of thousands of years ago. And I think that's, that's very compelling for people and uh, has generated a lot of interest. I mean, we were getting calls from the BBC about the, the, the skeletal finds in the subway, and I'm like, yeah, big deal, we find that stuff every day in my park. <laughs> but um, but it, is, it is this idea that in order to discover these elements of the past, it's almost always in the context of, of human use, right? Or human, we're digging for some sort of human, modern or futuristic project, right? Like, so the discovery of the Libre Tar Pits themselves is tied with the oil exploration and mining for asphalt in Hancock Park. A lot of the work that I do is actually in South America uh, in some somewhat remote regions sometimes where they're discovering fossils uh, because of the extractive industries. So uh, the tar pit site that I work on in Ecuador was discovered by the oil company doing maintenance on its land. The uh, I went on a, a research trip to Guyana where they had found giant sloth fossils in very, very remote rainforest in the context of gold mining. They also find fossils up in the Yukon during uh, extractive, what they call hydraulic gold mining. Titanoboa, this isn't my project, but what the biggest snake that's ever lived was found in a coal mine in Colombia. And so I think there is this intersection of sort of human modernization and, and future thinking and the discovery of the past. One of the things I think, oh, I'm sorry, could I respond to this? Yes, yeah, sure, quickly. Sure. We'll get one more question, then we'll just Yeah, go. sure. What the context I think of it in is, is in maybe in terms of water. I did a lot of work with the LA River. And water, basically the source of water, getting water to, for the city to survive and to grow. And the, the tectonics had an active role in sort of getting, where, getting water from different locations. And the LA River itself actually used to flow over the Sepulveda Pass into the LA Basin. And as tectonics changed that, uh, that region, the, the LA River continued to, to flow to the west. And, and even getting water from other locations, or foreign water, as, as the city of LA refers to it, water from outside of the region, um, that, that sort of human engineering story to get what we need uh, has been really been built around sort of the drama around tectonics. Um, and that, that's maybe sort of a, a very short story. But the other part I want to point out, too, which is kind of interesting, is I am a native of, of the Pasadena, Altadena area. I grew up in the San Gabriel Valley. I now live in West L.A. And I find the culture in West L.A. to be very different. And I think the culture is, is dominated by tectonics, as you get these interesting neighborhoods, these interesting cultures emerging in these different locations because of tectonics. They're separated maybe by hills or they're on the other side of the valley. The valley culture is very different. So I think tectonics has helped us shape sort of our, the way we've emerged as different regional type of people, even in Los Angeles. Boy, you just gave us a new conference idea, Bob. That's really cool. Um, Lynn, take us home.
and he made me think of something, and you made me think of something. Since you're talking about not just stuff that was 10 or 15,000 years ago, but to present with the tar pits, I always constantly get people talking about dead bodies in the tar pits, and that they find dead bodies in the tar pits. Whether it's MacArthur Park, whether it's Echo Park Lake, whether it's no matter what it is, whenever there's an open body of water, people insist that they're finding dead bodies there all the time. I don't know why people want that. I don't, I don't get it. But I'm always you know, doing the research on it and stuff like that. So I just wanted to get your like, official take on if that actually, if there's actually like, murder victims in the no, no murder victims that I know of, with the possible exception of this 9,000-year-old woman. Um, we do, I believe there may have been murder weapons found at points. I know that a few years ago there was a police operation diving in our lake pit that were looking for something. They never revealed exactly what it was. Uh, and, and people do occasionally, for reasons beyond my comprehension, try to get into the tar pits, but... <laughs> Uh, we usually uh, seem to be able to get them out alive. I, I, I read the story about the guy diving, and I just thought that was the worst job I could imagine. Because I'm going to die for a body in the carpet. So, thank you. Okay, so um, two quick housekeeping notes. We'll dismiss here. At, you know, these folks will be around. We're going to reconvene right at 11.15. Uh, with La Brea Woman, we've opened the door to human inhabitation of the beneath the surface, so we're going to investigate humans for the rest of the day. Um, two quick housekeeping notes. Uh, Taryn has also made these still images of the underground LA, so thank you so much for that. And Katie Dunham, will you raise your hand? Katie Dunham, I neglected to thank Katie. Uh, Katie Dunham is a communications and public relations expert. Um, we've had the privilege of working with Katie for many, many years on various projects, so I want to thank Katie publicly for her assistance in getting the word out. Many of you are here probably due to Katie's good work. So thank you, Katie, so much. Uh, remember, restrooms down the hall. Please help clean the room. Uh, get some more snacks while they're still there, assuming they're still there. And let's come back, and we'll start right at 11.15. Join me in thanking these experts. <laughs>